Oklahoma to around the world. I'm your host, Joe Cristiano, and this is your antidote to popular talk radio. Today, we are pleased to have Mr. Mark Faber as our guest. Mr. Faber has agreed to be our guest today to discuss the stability. I hopefully we'll discuss the stability of the world's financial situation. Hopefully, it's a lot more stable than the problems that we've had this morning with our board operation. But Mr. Faber is a Swiss investor based in Thailand and publisher of the Gloom, Boom, and Doom Report, and is the director of Mark Faber Limited, which acts as an investment advisor and fund manager. Uh, he can be reached on. Uh, through his website, uh, gloomboomanddoom.com. Uh, his worldview and scope of knowledge is second to none, and he'll be asked today about the risk of global collapse in the bond market. If you wish, you may call him with your questions or comments, 646-652-4620. Make sure you press the one button so we know that you want to interview, inter interfere with the program and ask your question. Mr. Faber, thank you so much for being on our show today. It's my pleasure. Thank you. Well, you know, I, I have to admit that uh, I'm uh, uh, I'm a real fan of yours. Uh, I, I probably listen to Thank you about you once a week, you know, in, on, online, and I truly enjoy your insights. Um, not long ago, I had uh, uh, Michael Pinto on, and of course, he's he's big in the bond market, and he's written a book about the uh, bond uh, on upcoming bond collapse, which he wrote back in 2003, and also Gerald Salente, he's not too happy about what's going on as well. And I was wondering what your take was. It seems that the world is 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 enveloped in debt. And, and the way we're going to get out of the malaise, the international malaise that we are in financially is creating more debt, lower interest rates, and uh, printing more money. Now, uh, I, I'm not the smartest guy in the world. I'll, I'll be the first to admit it. But it sure seems like this is lunatics running the asylum. Am I way off base or should I just find another profession at this point? <laughs> No, I've maintained that for a long time, that you cannot trust the monetary system to a bunch of academics, most of whom never worked in their lives except in academia and at government agencies such as the Federal Reserve and uh, other central banks in the world. And there's no question that it will end badly this unprecedented uh, monetary experiment. Here we have uh, recorded human history of something like five, 6,000 years, and interest rates have never been this low. We never had negative interest rates, and it is clear one day the bond market will react negatively. But it's not so crystal clear uh, how it will manifest itself. Because in theory, if you think about it in Japan, the Bank of Japan is essentially buying all the debts that are being issued by the Japanese Treasury. So that keeps rates very low. The question is, what will first happen? A collapse in the currency? And if there is a collapse in the currency, against what will the currency collapse you know you could argue some will argue well the yen will collapse against the us dollar or the euro will collapse against the us dollar and others will say well the us dollar will collapse against the yen and against the euro we don't know for sure but my sense is that uh currencies will continue to lose their purchasing power and if you recall, I mean, you're not that young anymore. So you also <laughs> lived through the 70s yes. and the early 80s when people were all concerned about accelerating inflation. And now the slogan is always deflation. But actually, in fact, if you look at home prices in the US, if you look at stock prices, if you look at art prices, at vintage cars, if you look at your insurance premiums, <laughs> and if you look right. at uh, the educational costs for your children and taxes and contributions to the government, everything has become massively more expensive. 
So I don't see any evidence of serious deflation where the price level, like in the depression years, dropped 30%. That hasn't happened. Some prices have gone down. So say someone will say, well, the price of a PC or a notebook or a mobile phone has gone down. But that is, again, depends on what model you buy. The models of computer I use, actually their prices have gone up. Now someone will come and say that the functionality of the computer you have is much better than today than it was five years ago. That's correct. But I also need a much better computer now to function in business than I needed at that time. Right. It's like 15 or 20 years ago, I didn't need the internet. We had faxes and telex machines and so forth. So it changes everything. <laughs> but in general, I would say the cost of living of people has gone up a lot. And that's why you see a relatively poor economy. Uh, most people have not benefited from the asset bubble because they have no money. <laughs> it's right. as simple as that. Yeah. And of course, it will end badly. Uh, socialism does not bring poverty. It is poverty that brings socialism. When people are disenchanted, when people are uh, unhappy about the system and uh, Trump, Donald Trump and Bernie Sanders are symptoms of a very unhappy population. Otherwise, they wouldn't have gone this far. Right. There is a, com but this is not only in the US, in democracies in general, there is a complete disconnect between the will of the people, between the people and the government officials. And uh, I think if most people understood what the Fed is doing, they would be against it. As it happened, as it happens, most people don't understand what the Fed is all about. They're more interested in Facebook pictures that right. only they look at and <laughs> nobody else. But basically, uh, it is a transvesty, travesty, the way central bankers are behaving and destroying the value of money. Yeah. And you have to also see there is credit growth that is useful. You talked earlier on about this debt bubble in the world. There is credit that is useful. Say you and I, we build a factory, we borrow money uh, to build the factory, to buy the land to acquire the machinery, to employ the employees, and to acquire inventories, and we start producing. Out of the production, we can then cover the interest payments and repay the debt. But our debt growth in the last 20, 30 years in the world has been debts that are unproductive, namely government debt, transfer payments. In other words, you take money out of your pocket and you give it to somebody else's pocket has no economic value at all and so i think you're right it will end very badly but if you ask me exactly how badly and when it will end badly i don't know my sense is that one way to protect yourself is through diversification you can't it's dangerous to have all your money in cash in a bank. That has to be understood. In an environment where central banks are destroying the value of money, it's dangerous to have only cash. So I would have some real estate with low leverage, and I would uh, have uh, maybe some equities. I have equities, and I would have uh, some precious metals. You know, And I would essentially avoid government bonds that have a negative yield. You understand, nowadays in the world, you have $8 trillion worth of bonds with a negative yield. Right. In other words, you're guaranteed to lose money. Maybe not that much, but you're guaranteed to lose some money. Right. Well, you, you know since what I'm I... such a great optimist, <laughs> I think I can make some money. <laughs> well, I, I guess, you know, I, I, I just keep on going back to, you know, my 
earlier years, and uh, I'm 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 still very young. I'm only seventy three, but I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna make it somehow. Yeah, okay. And um, but you know, my times were so different when I was building a businesses, and I've done a few of those. And 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 my is that, you know, you saved money, you invested it, you purchased uh, items that were producible, that produced income, you stayed out of debt. I mean, basically everything that I've learned, everything that I have done to become, to, to, to be where I am today, I own this whole studio and I do it for fun. I mean, can you imagine someone saying, oh yeah, I'm gonna open up a studio just for fun. But this is what I do. This is one of the it, things that I yes, do. It's that some people, you know, America do America has to be grateful to people like you. Thank you so much. I appreciate who, those words from who, you especially. Who, who, but yes. what bothers me is that the whole world seems to be contrary to the way I have built businesses and the way I have grown up. And what really surprises me is that the bastion of, of solid currency, your home homeland of Switzerland, isn't that not right? You're from, uh, you're, you're from, yes. you're from Switzerland, yes. has the highest negative interest rates in Europe, I believe. And you would think yes, if there would be one high. country standing up and I saying, no, this is wrong, it's, it would be the Swiss and they didn't do that. Is it is it a worldwide conspiracy? They all can't be on the same page for the same at the same time doing the same idiotic thing. What's your well, take on that? I want to tell you some people have talked about currency wars. There is no currency war except uh, there is coordination among central banks. They talk to each other daily, every day. The Bank of England, the Federal Reserve, the ECB, the Bank of Japan, right. they coordinate the monetary policy. So for a while, say the Fed eases, QE1, QE2, then uh, Operation Twist, QE3, then they say to the Japanese, well, you know, you better do something as well because your yen is too strong. Yep. So you have to bring the value down of the yen. So then they embark, and then the ECB embarks. And the problem for small countries like Switzerland is then, if they don't play the game, their currency appreciates very substantially. Now, don't misunderstand me. I personally, as an economist, I don't think that the strong currency is damaging your industry. Right. I That's agree. all. BS essentially broadcasted by entrepreneurs and industry. They always say, oh, the, the currency is too strong, we can't compete. Uh, the countries with the strongest currencies over longer periods of time, like Germany, Japan, Switzerland, they are the strongest exporting countries. Right. And the countries that have weak currencies over longer period of time, like Latin America, they have very weak industry. They have resources, but their industries are relatively weak. Strong currencies forces the entrepreneurs to become more and more productive. So, but in Switzerland, the view was then among politicians and so forth that they can't compete if the currency is strong. So they have to take measures to lower the value of their currency which to some extent they managed to do, but it has no positive impact on Switzerland. You understand? It's like in Japan, a weak yen hasn't been positive at all for the economy. In fact, it's been negative, say, you're a Japanese, you have your assets in yen. So two years ago, your assets in yen could be exchanged into US dollars at a 30% higher value. If you look at Japan, you measure the GDP in yen. In dollar terms, GDP is down 30% now. In dollar terms. Right. So you understand, these devaluations uh, are, is, are far from certain to be beneficial at all. But my sense is that all currencies will eventually continue to weaken and they'll probably weaken against uh, monetary assets like gold, silver, and uh, platinum. Well, you know, I, I, I took some basic 
economic courses when I went to college. And I, I went to a very good college, it was Pace College at the time in downtown New York, is in Wall Street area. And it was a, a, a very popular college for people who wanted to go into marketing or finance. And uh, I don't recall one page of economics history, economic theory that talked about the benefits of negative interest rates. Where did these clowns get this idea from? <laughs> yes, you said it. They're clowns. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> well, well, I, I want to tell you, the idea is basically that if you have excessive debts, you want to reduce the burden on the people that have the debts. But there are many unintended consequences for the system, say, let's say in America or throughout the world, a lot of people have savings. Say you could be in retirement, so you would have savings. You would have some income from your, the interest on your savings and you would have your pension and you would have social security or whatnot. Now, the people that have savings, they don't get anything. Right. In some countries, they're penalized. And number two, you see, the Fed and other central banks, they uh, brainwashed the world in kind of telling them deflation is bad and inflation is good. Right. This is utter economic nonsense because, say, in the 19th century in the U.S., we had a hundred years basically of price stability with intermediate periods of deflation. Right. But what happened is that the real wages went up. In other words, wages were stable or rising and the cost of transportation, the cost of living went down. And so people became richer. In other words, GDP per capita in real terms in the 19th century increased at the faster pace than after the Federal Reserve was formed. So it was not uh, a system where deflation was negative. Deflation has some negative aspects when you are over leveraged. But this is not the problem of deflation. It's the problem that the central bankers the clowns, <laughs> you call them so <laughs> appropriately. <laughs> they were sleeping on the wheel during the huge debt bubble they created at the end of the 1990s and then until 2007. And now they're creating an even greater debt bubble, but this time is largely government debt. That is the least productive debt. Yeah. Well, we've, we've been through now, <laughs> uh, this is the third major bubble in 15 years or so. Yes. You know, we've 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 had the the, the dot com bubble, the tech bug bubble. Um, we've yes. we've had the housing bubble, and and now we have a debt bubble or a, a bond bubble. And this this one trumps the other two significantly. Now, uh, we didn't solve the problem. In other words, the patient was dying back in 1998. Um, remember, long-term capital management, that blew up. Jim Rickards, who was the uh, uh, lead counsel at the time, um, you know, had to negotiate with Greenspan et al. in order to save the entire world from collapsing. Well, that is minuscule compared to what is occurring today. Uh, I, I just yes, wonder what these people are thinking of. They know it's not going to last. And what are they doing to prepare for the big one? Yes, they don't do anything. They, they just think uh, one of the central bankers said the other day, <laughs> we are magic people. <laughs> you understand? Yeah. It's not only that they're incompetent, but they're also arrogant. That is the problem. Number two, I mean, you raised the issue of LTCM, long-term capital. For the system, it would have been best if they had failed. Right. Because that was a time when it's not yet too big to fail. And then again, 
in the Nasdaq bubble, it would have been better to let it deflate further and let the system be cleaned out instead of as the neo-Keynesian all wanted to create another bubble. But you understand, you're dealing with the fund management industry and Wall Street. They love bubbles. Right. Because their fees are paid on net asset value. The worst for them is that actually asset prices decline, then they get less fees. So they encourage, actually, it's kind of a symbiotic relationship between the Goldman Sachs of this world. I'm not singling out Goldman Sachs, although maybe one should, and the central banks. The central banks, they will coordinate with the Wall Street people and so forth what to do. And when a central banker retires, he gets an advisory job with one of the Wall Street firms that pays a few million dollars a year. It's not my problem. I'm happy for them. I'm just saying it's basically a mafia that is not run by professional gangsters, but by clowns. But, as you say. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. <laughs> Well, you know, I, I, I usually give people the, you know, who are, are not in tune with the economics or the financial condition, you know, the average Joe Blow who needs things simplified. I say, well, just consider 1998, the patient got very sick and the doctors knew what type of medicine would be necessary in order to yes. save the patient. <laughs> but they decided that would be too much work. They just gave him a lot of morphine and he felt really good. So he popped out of bed and he's running around with all this morphine. <laughs> and then the morphine wore yes. off. And then he got really very, very sick and hardly walked. But they pumped him up with a whole bunch of morphine again. He got up and he was able to at least walk around with a cane, but he can walk around. And he felt pretty good about it. Well, now the patient is sick again and the morphine ain't going to work. So how well, do you see it's What do you see is going to, how it's, this thing is going to unravel? I see nothing but, I mean, I hate to be melodramatic, but it seems like almost Armageddon, financial Armageddon is, is, is before us and we're facing it in the... In, yeah, yeah, that, that, I basically agree with you, but you understand, if you print money, in theory, you can boost the Dow Jones to 100,000 within two years. Right. You just have to print enough. Right. And you can boost the Japanese market. You just print enough. Uh, where I have some hesitation to believe that entirely is I see some signs of inflation uh, rising. You understand? At some point, the money printing may not go into stocks and into bonds and into uh, art, where it may go into rising consumer prices. And then what happens, and this has, a, because I studied the process of high inflation countries or inflation in high, in countries with high inflation. What happens is that and this has happened in the US and in Europe, real wages go down. In other words, right. the cost of living of people is going up more than their wages. So the standards of living is declining. And, but when that happens, what usually then occurs is that the economy worsens significantly. Then the clowns at the central banks will say, well, and they will be supported by the likes of Krugman. Well, we need more. We didn't do enough. Right. Then they'll throw again money at the system. QE4, QE5, QE6. And that can go on for quite some time. You understand? The central bank can keep on buying the bonds that the treasury is issuing. I don't know how it will end. But I suppose that in this situation, people and investors will lose confidence in the system and they will want to own precious metals or some properties now some properties are too expensive but some properties around the world in the countryside are not that expensive you live in tulsa 
Well, maybe in prime location, it's expensive. It's like Phoenix. Uh, but in other locations, maybe not that expensive. That's correct. That's correct. Well, it, 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 you know, people want to blame all of the people who have money. And of course, they, they, they categorize everyone into one, one group. Uh, of course, there are those people within the system that are cheating the system, that are uh, connected with government, with industry, that have um, some sort of allegiance to uh, uh, individuals that they support for government, uh, for, for office, and as a result, they get kickbacks, and all that funny money and all that dirty stuff that goes on. But for the most part, there are people who adhere to basic uh, uh, valid economic principles like, you know, you produce, you invest, you save, you know, and the cycle, which are very few. I, I believe, and, and tell me if I'm wrong, those people who are adhering to the old paradigm of hard work, honest living, saving, you know, and, and doing the right thing, basically, economically and personally, these people are going to do extremely well because they're always prepared for catastrophe because that's the way they live. They always make sure that there's money on the side, that the money is allocated in a certain way, and that their business are productive and out of debt. Now, but these people are not the mega rich. These are the, just the, the, those people who are doing well because they adhere to uh, principles of economics that are valid. Do you agree with that? Yes, of course. I mean, uh, as is uh, the case for you, you see, my parents, they had uh, lived through World War II. Right. And my grandparents, they had lived through World War I and the Depression years and in Germany, the hyperinflation years. They had one disaster after another right. in the 20th century. So after World War II, they were, of course, financially extremely conservative. Right. In my family, nobody ever borrowed any money. <laughs> if they saved, when they had enough savings, they bought the car or whatever it is. They would never have dreamt to buy anything on installment credit, nor would I. But this has changed this mentality and also the whole entitlement mentality. Each time something happens, oh, the government should help me. Well, you want freedom, you have to accept personal responsibility. If you're not prepared to have your personal responsibility, then you should go and live in a socialist country. Yeah, like the United you know, that States. Is now creeping in. <laughs> it's creeping in in Europe and in the US. Yeah, but aren't we a socialist country now? I mean, for all intent purposes, uh, the money is absconded from the productive and then <laughs> divvied out to uh, political well, political favors. And for those people who are producing nothing, <laughs> government, although is Maybe. not growing anymore, but people who work for the government are, in fact, not producing anything and shouldn't even be included in the um, employment certificates. Certif uh, certi yeah, certificates. I agree with you. I don't think that government spending should be included in uh, GDP. Right. It should be deducted. But, uh, you understand? I also believe we don't have a socialist system the way we had it in the Soviet Union and in China and Vietnam and in Eastern Europe uh, following the Second World War or in Russia since 1918. But we have maybe a worse combination. We have crony capitalism, as right. you just hinted before, uh, unless a large businessman becomes kind of uh, in entangled with the government, he is in, at the disadvantage. He's almost forced to have lobbies for him and to do things for him, otherwise, legislation may be unfavorable for him so we have crony capitalism on the one hand and i have to say this uh, your listeners should pay attention to the federal reserve and other central banks they have financed the expansion of government becoming bigger and bigger correct and the debt grows and the deficits 
And then you have more and more regulation and more and more harassment of the small businessman. And the larger the government is, you've seen all these studies, productivity is not rising much. Is the productivity improvements are very disappointing. This has to do, the bigger the government, the less productivity growth there is. Right, yeah. You know, it's, it's, it's I, I, I said this, gave the story out, uh, relay the story on my show so many times, I'm sure uh, if people hear it one more time, they're gonna start hanging up. But, you know, my, my father came here from the old country uh, with not a dime in his pocket and he complained all of his life that the biggest mistake he ever made was borrowing $14 from his future mother-in-law because she <laughs> really she Especially never the mother-in-law. <laughs> <laughs> she, she never made him forget it and do you know that on his deathbed he was still complaining about that <laughs> <laughs> I'm not kidding. He said, the biggest mistake I ever made. I said, Bob, please take care of yourself. Please be relaxed, you know, for a while. You know, he still complained about that. And I, I'm reminded of that several times daily when I meet people and I see the, when I watch television and I see the way people handle money, handle themselves, their lifestyle. I think either I'm the lunatic or the whole world has gone crazy, but I don't yes, identify with you, it at you all. You understand? I will give you a, an argument that someone raised the other day with me. He said, well, you know, zero and negative interest rates are very good because they stimulate huge innovation. Now, the Nasdaq bubble was a deliberate creation of Mr. Alan Greenspan. I know this from a former Fed voting a member. He, Greenspan thought that by creating a Nasdaq bubble, it would fuel innovation and so forth, which to some extent is true. But you understand when you take economic policy measures, you have to look at all aspects. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, each policy measure may have some beneficial impact, some but huge negative impacts. Most American families, the median American wealth in America is lower than it was in the year 2000 because bubbles enrich a few, Wall Street, and impoverishes the majority, already observed by the famous American economist Irving Fisher. Hmm. It impoverishes the majority. Right. How many families I've went to Atlanta after the housing bubble. It's actually tragic to see all these homes where people were evicted. They had children. The children went to local schools. And these families were kicked out of the homes. Do you think it's fun? Do you think it's a nice thing to do? This, I make the Federal Reserve responsible. And by the way, who was responsible for the greatest housing bubbles? California, Nevada. That's right. And, yep. um, and I think also... The Florida was big in, in that. Yeah, but Yellen was in charge of the Fed in San Francisco, president. Oh, I see. Yes. And Nevada, the three biggest housing bubbles were, yes, uh, California, Arizona, and Nevada. Mm -hmm. She was in charge of those districts. Ah. She's the money printer par excellence. Ah, I see. Right. Well, uh, we're, we're, we're She's running... the number one clown. <laughs> number one clown, okay. <laughs> All right, we're, we're running close to the end of our show. Yes. But I, before, we, before we sign off, I'd, I'd like for you to look into your crystal ball, just polish it off if you can, yes. and tell us, what do you, how do you see things unwinding? Obviously, it cannot go on forever. There's, there's, there's Mother Nature always has a way of coming back and saying, okay, guys, you had your fun. Um, now we're going to correct everything. And uh, those people, you know, who were playing the game are now going to suffer a little bit because you had too much fun. Mother Nature has a way of always neutralizing everything. Yes. What, is, what is your take? How do you see this whole thing unraveling? Well, I think uh, when things will go bad, they'll print more money. And when that doesn't help, 
there may be social unrest or, or what nations frequently have done is uh, they started to take money away from the rich you know we talked about this uh, wealthy people before i would say a lot of wealthy people they haven't done anything terribly wrong it's the federal reserve that made them rich you understand because right. the federal reserves with their easy monetary policies boosted asset prices if you have no assets you don't benefit but if you already have money homes and stocks and bonds you benefited enormously and i believe these people uh, including to some extent you and me who have assets you said you have your studio we will uh, lose money some will be taken away from us wealth right. taxes or higher taxes on incomes or on capital gains or they can introduce a wealth tax and say we take 20 percent of all the wealth from the rich people away it's not going to help but to satisfy the unrest among the people it will be a measure that populist governments will do number three i think there is the possibility and uh, it's very clear that we have a rise in international tensions very clearly uh, partly because the u.s is unreasonable about uh, the rise of china it is clear that the chinese want to have some security in the south and east china sea which the u.s has a different view about and so forth the u.s and nato also harassed putin i'm not saying that putin is a nice guy but you understand for russia the Crimea is of paramount strategic importance. Right. It has zero value for the U.S., zero value for NATO. But for Russia, it has value. So they miscalculated there. They miscalculated about the whole eastern Ukraine, which is east of the Dnieper. And so the tensions are actually quite high. In the Middle East, we have essentially a complete mess. Right. Complete mess. Yeah. <coughs> And how this all will end, I don't know. But I would hold some precious metals physically in physical form. Okay. Well, you know, when I was uh, when I was growing up in Harlem, New York, you know, the warlords were always guys you wanted to stay on the right side of. You know, <laughs> you, you didn't want to be on the wrong side of somebody who was the head of the gangs in New York and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah sure. And and so to to me, uh, I always think. You know, if if they if we should have one friend in the world, it should be Russia. If we they shouldn't be our enemy. We should trade the trade with them like yes. crazy. Um, our yes. second best friend should be China. Our third best friend should be India. The fourth should be Brazil. I mean, this is the way I would do things. But it seems as yes, soon as someone I agree becomes, with you. Yeah. I mean, you understand? Culturally, Russia was much closer to Europe than to any other region in the world. Right. And we Europeans, you could ask any German, 90% of Germans do not understand the policy of Angela Merkel. Most people in Europe, they believe that actually she's being blackmailed by the CIA or somebody yeah, because yeah. of her past. Yeah. But we don't understand because in the 19th century until the beginning of the 20th century uh, russia's border was with uh, germany and with the austrian uh, empire austrian hungarian empire right. not with poland it didn't exist at the time That's ukraine right. didn't exist and so culturally europe and russia were always very close but i tell you i don't understand we have these interventionists. You call yourself Liberty Radio. We have the interventionists. These are people who believe that they are kind of superior, that they know better than ordinary people. They may have more education. They may have gone to Harvard, but it doesn't make them smarter or more intelligent. It just uh, they just paid a high fee to these universities. 
Anyway, thank you for your time. Well, uh, let me give you the last, uh, just the last minute of our broadcast to, to uh, alert our uh, listeners how they may reach you if you'd like, or that your something about your website. Yeah. Uh, I'll let you close it out. And but before we do, I want to I want you to know that we're honored to have you on our program, and we do hope <laughs> that you will accept our invitation to return at a later date. Yes, thank you very okay. much. And very please, nice talking to you. See. The website is gloomboomdoom.com. I repeat, gloomboomdoom.com. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, <laughs> Mr. Faber. Hope to hear from you again. Thank you so much. Folks, this is the end of today's broadcast. We'd like to thank our sponsors for the financial support, and we'd like to thank you for listening in. You can further the cause of liberty by recommending this program to your friends, and let us hear from you. Our email address is comments at libertytalkradio.com. Remember, you're either allowing your liberties to be taken away or you're striving to protect them. Unfortunately, folks, there is no middle ground. Until next time, this is Joe Cristiano. You've been listening to Liberty Talk Radio. Stay well. Stay tuned.